Okay, hi folks. I am letting everyone in from our waiting room and YouTube has started, but the talk does not start for another seven minutes. So we're just hanging out right now. I have a variety of resources that I could paste into the chat now if that works. Vivian, you're on mute. Yes. Go ahead and feel free to do that. The The only thing about that is people who come in later won't be able to see that, but we can always just repost them later too. So if you want to go ahead and start that. And Arvin, since you're starting a Google Doc, maybe if you could add the a section for the resources and then we can just paste them in again toward the end of the talk. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? So welcome everybody. We will be getting started with the talk at 7.30, so just hang out for a little bit. For those of you who are just joining us, your audio is working just fine. We are going to be starting the talk in about three minutes, and so we're just being quiet now. But uh, Susan is posting some really great resources in chat, and we will repost them later on in the talk for the folks who come in later. But there's a lot of great resources and interesting information in the chat right now that Susan is sharing with us.
We have someone in chat who is saying that they tried the first link and it wasn't found. Oh, there Jennifer's asking. Susan, I don't know if you're watching the uh, chat. Oh, there we go. The um, the talk, the Santa Clara Valley talk, because that I did on YouTube because I. I have not checked all of these um, links, but I did check that one earlier. Hmm. Oh, the biodiversity one. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, folks, it is 7.30, and so we will, our, we'll get started. I am Vivian New. I'm going to be your host tonight, and I hope you are here to see this wonderful talk, Butterflies and Moths, What Can I Do? Building Habitat in Your Garden by Susan Karasoff. If that's not the talk you were here to see, I suggest you still stay, stay and hear it because this is a fabulous, fabulous talk. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone, the Amamutsan Tribal Band, the Tamian Nation, and the Ramayatush Ohlone. We still live and thrive in this area today. We hope to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and to heal from historical trauma. If this is the first time you've joined us for one of our talks, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you're comfortable with that, please share that in chat. Doesn't matter if you're on YouTube or Zoom, we have people monitoring chat in both places. And these talks are done by a team, not just one or two people. Um, tonight, as I mentioned before, I'm your host. We have our QA, well, actually a uh, QA moderator, who is Jennifer Durking. So she will be asking um, your questions to, Su of, to Susan. So at any point during the talk, please feel free to type questions into chat. Do not ask them out loud and on audio, just type into chat. We are monitoring chat both on YouTube and on Zoom. And Jennifer will be asking all of those questions of Susan at the end of the talk. And so on Zoom, we have Arvind Kumar, who's mon monitoring that chat. Jennifer, as I mentioned before, is going to be uh, asking the questions. And I am also going to be the one monitoring the chat on YouTube. And of course, we have Susan as our speaker tonight. If you are not familiar with CNPS, we are a nonprofit environmental organization founded in 1965. We have over actually 12,000 members, I forgot to update the slide, in 36 chapters that are spread all over California. And we even go beyond the bounds of not just our state, but our country, because we have a chapter in Baja, California as well. Our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter, and it covers all of Santa Clara County and Southern San Mateo County. Uh, Susan is actually from the Yerba Buena chapter, which mm -hmm. covers San Francisco and Northern San Mateo County. So we're very happy to have Susan here from the Yerba Buena chapter. Uh, the CNPS's mission is to protect California's native plants and their na natural habitats today and into the future. And we do that through science, education, stewardship, gardening, and advocacy. If you're not currently a member of CMPS, we would love to have you join our movement to conserve California's native plant diversity. Uh, as a member, besides supporting programs like this one, you'll also receive two 
fabulous magazines. Artemisia, which is a science-oriented magazine, has a lot of great articles about native plants. And Flora, which has more general interest, and has a lot of great um, articles about gardening. You'll also receive our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which tells you about upcoming events and also has a lot of interesting articles about local things that are going on. You also receive discounts at participating local nurseries and more. So if that sounds interesting to you, just either point your uh, device at our QR code and it'll take you right to the sign up online or you can go to cnps.org slash join and you'll get that same form. You can just sign up online. We have a bunch of events. Our chapter has a bunch of events coming up in August. Uh, Habitat Restoration uh, next Saturday and the Saturday following. And that's actually led by Arvind, who is the one monitoring our Zoom chat tonight. And again, but led by Arvind, we have a walk coming up on the coast uh, in Bean Hallow State Park in Pescadero. And that's on August 20th at 9.30 in the morning. You do need to sign up in advance for that. So you, that's on our meetup. Um, group, which is at the bottom there. We also have a photo group that meets virtually every uh, third Friday of the month. So our next meeting is coming up on August 25th. It's a great activity, um, whether or not you're a photographer or you simply like to look at beautiful pictures, but it's a fun place and you can drop in and you can find out more about that on our website. And then we have a talk, another talk coming up at the end of the month. That is an in-person only talk at the Los Altos Library, Year-Round Color with Native Plants, um, which is, will be by Madeline Morrow. And I'm very, very excited. In fact, I think this is probably the first place this has been announced publicly. But save the date, because on October 21st, we are having our native plant sale. And this is the first time since the pandemic started that we are going to be back in the nursery. None of this online ordering in advance. You can just come and buy your plants in person. There will be people there to help you and answer questions. There will be vendors. There will be lots of informational booths. It's going to be a wonderful time. So save that date. And if you are not currently on our chapter news mailing list, I highly recommend joining. That is a way to get a little weekly reminder of what's coming up. Things like this talk, which got scheduled sort of late in the game and wasn't included in our um, newsletter, you find out about, about things like this. So join that mailing list. Um, you can either do it with by sending email to that this uh, email address on your screen, or you can go to our website, cnps-scv.org, and there's information there again about how to do this. Before the talk started, there's a little bit of housekeeping, so I would like everyone to please mute your microphones. In fact, I am just going to go ahead and click the mute all button right now. As I mentioned before, if you have any questions or comments, please share them in the chat. Do not unmute yourself and ask them. Um, we are monitoring chat on both YouTube and on Zoom, and we will make sure that your questions are shared with Jennifer at the appropriate time. We do expect to finish by about 9 p.m. And as I mentioned, this is on YouTube, and it will be available for viewing later. So if you want to go back and review something or if you want to share the, the link with somebody else, it is there on our YouTube channel. And now the main program, Butterflies and Moths, What Can I Do? Building Habitat in Your Garden. So, but it's a talk by Susan Karasoff. She is with our Yerba Buena chapter to the north. Susan is an amazing speaker. I have heard her give a version of this talk in the past. I am just so thrilled that she is able to take the time to join us tonight and, and give the talk. If you are starting to plan for your fall planting, this is a perfect talk to hear before you make your plant decisions because Susan is going to blow your mind with these amazing pictures, amazing information, and I am going to turn it over to you now, Susan. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you, Vivian. So we're going to talk about butterflies and moths because you can make a difference. Each one of us can. I'm Susan Karasoff from the California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena chapter. 
We're going to talk about what are native plants and actions you can take. And we might not get farther than that. Um, there is a, a link in the chat to a previous presentation that I did for CNPS Santa Clara Valley, where we really uh, delved into the specific plants. All of those charts are in here, but if we if we spend a lot of time on actions you can take, because I'm going to encourage all of you to, to be piling on and helping us in Zoom to understand how we can all support each other in actions you can take. Just in case we don't get to the rest of it, I want you to know that the rest of it is available online. If we get to it, we'll be talking about butterflies and plant communities, butterfly caterpillar plants in the garden, container gardening for butterflies, year-round buffets for people in wildlife, and native garden resources. So what are native plants? Native plants are climate resilient. They evolved in our soil with our fog and wind and in our extremely variable rainfall. They are used to dry summers. Um, they are used to an extreme variation between, in San Francisco, as little as seven inches of rain a year and as much as 50. Last year, we had 32 inches of rain. Our average is 21. So it shows you just how much variation these plants are already adapted to once they're somewhere between one to five years old. And they evolved in plant communities. They evolved together. All of those different plants have got different root depths from the short little annuals to bulbs to rhizomes to plants with tap roots. And there are mushroom networks between those plants that help plants keep each other alive, sharing water and nutrients so that all of those plants can make it through our dry summers and that all of these plants can make it together through what are becoming um, more and more dry years, even in the rain year. So not only did the plants evolve in plant communities, but our butterflies and moths and all of our wildlife co-evolved with plants. So let's think about what plants want. About 80% of plants are wildlife pollinated. About 15% are um, are wind pollinated. So those will be the hazelnuts and the grapes and the walnuts. And a few are water pollinated, about 5%, and that's things like kelp. But for those 80%, they evolved with specific pollinators. Those flower shapes, flower color, and bloom time can tell you a lot about who they expect to have pollinate them. And with climate change, I'm seeing things bloom earlier and bloom later. So having as close to a year round buffet, if you are someplace that doesn't get snow and frost, if you can make sure that you have long blooming plants in your garden and plants that effectively give you, give wildlife something, some kind of flower to go to year round for, for sustenance, that makes all the difference in having our gardens prepared for climate change. So that's what plants want. They want to be pollinated and they offer seeds and berries and nuts to wildlife like us and birds to take those seeds and berries and nuts and move them farther away from the mother plant, hopefully someplace that's got a lovely bit of resource in terms of water and soil so that that baby plant can thrive. That's what plants want. What plants don't want is to have their leaves eaten. So look outside a window and identify how many of those leaves you can eat. Yet yeah, not very many. Even if you've planned an edible garden, you may have half a dozen, or if you've got a very big edible garden, maybe a dozen different plant leaves you can eat. But most of your garden plants, you can't eat those leaves. They taste terrible. And that's because plants evolved chemicals in their leaves to keep wildlife like us and insects from eating the leaves. They want us to uh, help them with the pollen and they'll give us nectar and seeds and berries, but no, no, not the leaves. And so that's why it's important that we plant those native plants because we've got 1,300 
butterflies and moths in California that evolved with the native plant leaves. And they are expecting to have those leaves in the environment. Those caterpillars evolved over thousands and tens of thousands of years so that they could tolerate specific chemicals in a small set of leaves. So I am so impressed with Santa Clara Valley. I can look on, iNat on iNaturalist and see how many of you are planting milkweed. And that is amazing because if we have to have those milkweed plants if we're going to have monarch butterfly caterpillars fed. But milkweed only feeds five caterpillar species. We've got the rest of those 1,300 that want to get fed. And so there's been some really interesting research by a guy named Doug Tallamy and um, Santa Clara Valley. You have Doug Tallamy lectures on your YouTube channel, and I really appreciate that. I got a chance to attend one of those in person. I'm such a fangirl. And he realized that different plants support different numbers of caterpillar species in addition to different kinds of caterpillar species. And he's calling those keystone plants, the ones that support hundreds of, of caterpillar species. So willows support over 300, the oaks support over 200, the local cherries support over 200. These are big deal plants to have in our community because those introduced plants feed between zero and two of our native caterpillar species. So just in case you think, wait a minute, I've seen more leaves chewed than that. Yeah, we have some, um, we have some cabbage white butterflies. They seem to be able to eat a lot of different leaves and they're from Europe. So they're not as delicious to our birds. And Doug Tallamy and his graduate students did the math and realized that it takes six thousand caterpillars to get one nest of baby birds um, big enough to be able to leave the nest and find their own food. So Jennifer Durking, I really loved your comment that our, our landscape needs to be dripping in caterpillars for us to have enough food for those birds in addition for us to have butterflies. So not only do we have these leaf spe specialists in terms of the butterflies and the moths and other insects um, that go through a caterpillar phase. We have specialist bees. California has 1,500 bee species and over 600 of them are pollen specialists. So the good news is the flowers are just fine with giving away that pollen. That's why they want the bees to come visit. And the bad news is we don't have enough of these plants in our landscape either. So. If you look at this list for the specialist bees, um, where the sunflowers and the mock heather and the grindelia and the golden asters, the heterothica and the, the golden rods and the seaside daisies are at the top of the list, and you compare it to the caterpillar list, wow, those are completely different lists. So to me, this says plant everything. Plant everything. I am specifically planting for those caterpillar specialists, for those um, specialist bees, but plant all those native plants and see who shows up. Because introduced plant pollen, that feeds zero of our over 600 specialist baby bees, and we need to feed them. We need all of our pollinators. I want us to have um, as resilient an ecosystem as we can have. And if I am missing the resilience that evolved here, that makes me sad and I know I can fix it. So compare, compare. Yeah, I want, I want all my local native plants. So we need to feed the adult butterflies and that for years and decades, actually probably longer than that, is what we thought we were doing to feed butterflies and yet butterfly populations were declining. This is still important. It is still important to plant a whole bunch of native plants to have that very long bloom period. Those early blooming plants, the, the manzanitas, those are incredible. The, um, the, the currants, the ribes, the seaside daisy, those are important plants because they are around in the winter when our queen bumblebees are arriving and our hummingbirds that do not want 
to migrate. They can migrate, but they don't want to. They're territorial. They want to they want to have an area where all those plants belong to them. Those are the plants that we need to have in our in our landscape because they're early blooming. And then we need those later blooming plants as well. The sunflowers, the buckwheats, the gumweed, the, the grindelia, the goldenrod, the coyote bush, the golden asters, and the milkweed, um, and the yarrow so that we can have something blooming right now in August and September and October as it gets drier and drier and drier and most of the plants bloom between March and June, all of them have already just shut down. They're like, oh yeah, we're done. We're waiting for the rain. And these late blooming plants are so important because they keep that pollen and nectar buffet going and because they feed those specialist bees as well as the butterflies and other insects that are looking for dinner. Lots of nice long blooming plants that, will, that, that can feed adult butterflies as well as having their leaves feed caterpillars. All of those little white marks with the number and the little butterfly icon, that, that tells you how many of these species, um, different caterpillar and moth species can be fed by that particular plant. So one of the things you can do is help contribute to a butterfly corridor near you. We want corridors for butterflies to fly back and forth and we want it with the caterpillar plants, and we want it with uh, the pollen and nectar. And so this is for the pale tiger swallowtail. It's one of the swallowtails we have in the Bay Area. And we can take a look at um, where those observations are on a naturalist. And all of the gaps in between are someplace where we need to have both the caterpillar plants and some nectar plants to feed those butterflies. That's how we figure out where to plant and what to plant. Kalski can tell us what the, the plant is, what the plant leaves are. And Calflora's actually got a very good tool about telling us when the bloom period is. So um, I love iNaturalist because I can see where the butterflies are. I can see where the plants are. iNaturalist was built to, to give you wild observations. I'm fine with us putting all of the plants that we have purposely added into our environment and taking pictures of those. There's a little box you can check that says cultivated slash captive. Go ahead and do that. That we, we have to do that. At least in San Francisco, we are 68% paved. And of the remaining 32%, less than 1% are native plants. We have to put those plants back into the spaces where we can plant so that we can have these butterflies. So climate change, we're going to need water to get plants established. Even um, chaparral plants like California lilac and manzanitas, those need their first summer of water to just make it to the point where they can, they can make it to the next rainy season and then they're fine. A lot of plants need even more water than that. Um, oak woodland understory plants, huckleberries, maples, um, the hazelnut, those all need three to five years of water, of summer water. And so I strongly recommend if you have someplace where you could put uh, a rainwater capture and irrigation system that you, that you do that, um, you add that. This is gonna make all the difference in getting new plants established during climate change and being able to continue watering water plants that need more water. A lot of our fruit and nut trees just, they need more water than they're going to get in our extremely varied climate and are even more varied climate in the future. So please consider doing that if you can. There's a lot of funding to put in rainwater systems. And especially if you are planting in a public space, for your own garden, you may be able to really keep those plants uh, alive where we are the southern tip of their range. If you look on these maps, both Calscape and Calflora have got range maps. I'm using the Calflora map because the Calscape map has got yellow dots and they're just harder to see. With Calflora, it's blue dots. On the left, that's a pink flowering current. That's got a range all the way down to San Diego. On the right, that's that hazelnut that I'm absolutely in love with that I have a couple in my garden and I've 
added a couple to my neighbor's garden, and we are the southern tip for that plant. They're both understory oak woodland plants. The pink flowering current would really appreciate a couple of years of southern of summer water, but it can deal with just one. That hazelnut, that swamps five years of summer water, and I don't know how it's going to deal with the, the changes in temperature that we're going to see. Both of these plants are going to do fine in terms of years where we have a lot of atmospheric rivers. They won't be like the Southern California plants that have been planted in San Francisco by our Recreation and Parks Department, uh, where a lot of those just keeled over with just 32 inches of rain they, they couldn't manage. All of our local plants made it. A lot of the Southern California plants, the ones that, that start in Southern California and go south, they're not expecting as much rain as we will occasionally get. So really consider planting our local plants, but the ones that have got a southerly range. And we've got, we just got lots of those plants. The Toyon, the Coast Live Oak, a lot of, I only have Coast Live Oak, Santa Clara Valley. You've got more oak selections, but those are all, they all have ranges all the way to the south. So please don't, please don't, plant an oak that starts its range in Southern California. Choose one that's here that supports those hundreds of caterpillar species right now that still has a nice southerly range. The oaks, the toyons, the buckeyes, the lupines, the currants, a lot of them have got a southerly range. So consider planting those. And when you add something where we are the southern tip of it so that big leaf maple, the huckleberry, the hazelnut, just be aware that you need to put that someplace where it's really going to have someone looking in on it. So actions you can take. Together, we can do so much. Bring your skills and your interests and your curiosity and I've got a long list here. There's going to be other things I'm going to talk about. Any of those things that you're interested in, do it. One of the things that humans assume is that the impact we make is equal to the amount of effort that it takes. And that's just not true. You can plant uh, just a little patch of poppies and it will make a difference to bees just as soon as they bloom. Clarkia, uh, we've got all the Clarkia is a wildflower. If you haven't planted that, it's just gorgeous. And those can take some shade and they're amazing. Um, these are plants that are great for, um, for all kinds of wildlife. And it's a very small amount of space and a small amount of effort to get those plants going. So plant native plants. If you've never gardened before, start with some of those, um, those wildflower seeds. Join neighborhood groups. If you've got extra plants in your garden, offer the opportunity for people to show up and dig up some free plants and put those in their garden. Build those native plant corridors. Connect with the people around you. The city of Mountain View is starting a biodiversity strategy. If you are comfortable calling into city meetings or going to them, please do that. The city of, of, there are some people in Fremont who are adding native trees to the street tree list. Do that. Consider putting in the chat where you are and what you feel like offering to the world around you. If you've got seeds or extra plants or the ability to do um, illustrated brochures or if you like to remove invasive plants and there's this green space near you, but you know that if you remove an invasive plant, you need to add a native plant to it as soon as there's a rainy season, get together with community groups and ask for help and start stewarding those spaces. Um, I'm not only with California Native Plant Society of Yerba Buena, but I'm also with a neighborhood group and we have 15 spaces and eight people to steward them. So I don't have stewards for every space. I need more stewards. I need more people who will show up and keep those baby plants alive with water and pull the weeds away from them. 
Um, as it is with those spaces, all we do is we show up once a year and, and take out at least the worst of the invasive plants. But with other people, you've got other people who can water, other people who can weed. You can go on vacation. You can go to family reunions. Now that we don't have um, quite, now that we have at least um, vaccines for COVID, we have the opportunity to get together with people again. And so I know a lot of people who like to go out of town. I like to go out of town too. Having other people you can garden in a, in a public space with is wonderful. If you want to do this, but you're not sure where to start, some of those opportunities that um, to meet people, both here on Zoom, which is something that we want to take advantage of, but also go to Santa Clara Valley or any of your other California Native Plant Society restoration work and gardening efforts, show up, meet people and say, hey, there's this intersection near me and it's full of ivy and I would like to plant something else there. Who can help me steward it? Where can I get some free plants? Where can I get some free seeds? When should I plant? What should I plant there? Save your native plant seeds. Share those native plant seeds. Ask your neighbors to join you in planting native plants. If you have a cranky neighbor, skip them and go to some neighbor who will be more welcoming. <laughs> Propagate native plants. I know um, there are nine people in my chapter who are propagating native plants and just giving those plants away for free to community groups and to schools. And it's making a huge difference. Um, we've got school gardens that just used to be nothing but ivy and uh, invasive plants, and now they're full of native plants. And it's, it's amazing. So we all live in spaces that are designed. We may not think about it, but everything around us is, a, is, is designed and we can design well or we can design badly. A lot of people need help with landscape design. If they, if you're going to redo an entire yard, do, do talk to a landscape designer. But if you just need some ideas, if there are those of you who could do some small project and could offer some landscape um, recommendations, that would be fantastic. That would be a huge help. I have personally gotten better about this over time. I used to be pretty bad, um, you know, tall and back, short and front. I've still made those mistakes, <laughs> but it's a, it's a great way to help the spaces around you. Hike in our green spaces and lead hikes in our green spaces and lead those hikes for not only California Native Plant Society, but Audubon and other groups that are planting native plants um, and help people identify the wildlife around us. Like I spoke earlier, please collect rainwater if there's any way you can do that. Good chance that your water company will help you do that. iNaturalist is a good way to contribute to citizen science data. So if what you like to do is get out there and take photos, get out there and take photos. Get out there and take photos of the wildlife that's out there and the plants that they're using iNaturalist, eBird for you birders, it, it's so useful, not only to those of us who are trying to figure out what I need to plant, what can grow near me, and what can support wildlife, but it's good for researchers as well. Illustrate brochures, create plant lists for your community, map butterfly corridors, make videos and tell stories and become a map, a naturalist and dance with butterflies and just invent new programs like Jennifer Durking did for the wildflower amb ambassador. Jennifer, tell us about that. Which means Me you unmute for a sec there. Yeah, basically, um, thanks to CNPS Santa Clara Valley, um, we were able to start up a group. We have a, I can post a link in a moment to the website, but we basically started a group that uh, gets together periodically, goes on a local maybe field trip to a different uh, native garden. And then we distribute um, at different CNPS events, we distribute free wildflower seed packets, like we will be doing at the um, plant uh, sale on October 21st. And um, basically, and we do that with handouts and all sorts of information. So as we share that with people, um, they get inspired and they can ask questions. And it's, we've heard feedback from so many people who said, I was just getting ready to start my whole garden from scratch. Um, now I'm gonna work with a native plant designer or um, people who say, 
oh, I'm going to scatter these wildflowers, but maybe I'll put in some shrubs and other more permanent foundation plants. So we're really, I feel like it's really a way to make a difference, but also um, get new people excited about what's going on um, with native plants and what they can do. Um, I think that's, I think I covered everything, but a lot of people just aren't aware of this connection between the plants and the ecosystems. So it's just a way to get people to start getting more natives in their yard. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm so impressed with what you and Santa Clara Valley are doing. If you are comfortable getting on phone calls and advocating with your city and your county and your open space and the state about adding native plants, the, the state of California does a lot of funding of, of um, native plants or, or, well, they do a lot of green funding. Um, so they'll do uh, California Coastal Conservancy, CAL FIRE, California Climate Investments. A lot of these agencies within the state of California have got grants that they give to community groups. So one of the, the values of you getting together and working with your local community groups and faith groups is working together, understanding what everybody can do, making sure that you've got backup for each other, and then having that ability to apply for a grant. Your water company has money and wants to pay you. If you are in Southern California, the Metropolitan Water Company that is your water wholesaler for 17 million people has gone from drought tolerant plants to just native plants because they understand that there is an enormous difference in the ability of that plant um, and the plant community when they're planted together to withstand drought and to manage those atmospheric rivers. So there's a lot of money out there um, for the work that you would be doing with, with your group. Um, please consider advocating with me to the state of California that they only fund local native plants when they do greening. Right, that, right now, that's not how that works. They'll fund anything that's drought tolerant um, with the understanding that the California Coastal Conservancy also funds um, creek side restoration and those aren't drought tolerant um, restoration opportunities. They understand that too. But it's so important that we plant those native plants to feed those butterflies. There are um, there's state agencies, there's federal agencies, your water company, there are... Um, foundations and nonprofits. There are companies that are funding things. There's a whole set of, of funding just for children's gardens and school gardens. Um, whole Foods has a whole kid foundation. So if that's if that's where your you and your community garden are, where you're ready to, to go and get grants to get that work done, we just have a lot of opportunities for that. All right, I think we have time to talk about butterflies and plant communities and the actual plants. So if you live on or near a dune and dune scrub area, um, we have got, we've got federally endangered butterflies. We have got threatened butterflies. We've got extinct butterflies, unfortunately. The Xerxes um, group is named after the Xerxes blue that is already extinct. So if you could put in local lupines, local buckwheat, and deerweed that would help our butterflies so much. Um, the deerweed is the same all the way down to Southern California, but the buckwheat really varies. So please plant your local one. If when you are seed saving, you happen to have something from a different part of California, just understand that, that um, your local chapter of California Native Plant Society isn't gonna want those seeds for really particular, especially about the buckwheats. Um, We've got some other gorgeous butterflies, though, that also use buckwheat that that are doing a little bit better than the coastal green hair streak um, and the Xerxes that used the buckwheat. We not only have lupines and buckwheat and deer uh, and deerweed, but also the sagebrush, the local cherry, the holly leaf cherry for the Equazure. The holly leaf cherry is a thirty-five foot. Um, wind and fog loving tree. It's not lollipop um, shaped because it goes, it grows all the way down to the ground to protect the plants behind it from fog and wind. You can trim it like a lollipop, but if you're off on the, 
in, in the dunes and dune scrub area and you would like some wind protection, holly leaf cherry, it is fantastic. The, um, the, the cherry from Southern California doesn't support as many, um, as many caterpillars on its leaves. So please don't plant them unless you live in Southern California. The holly leaf cherry has a range all the way down to Los Angeles, which is where the Prunus folia leone picks up. Pale tiger swallowtail, that holly leaf cherry, California lilac, um, gray hair streak, the painted lady you may see quite a bit of. It's got a few more plants that it can use. And there are some specific ones in Santa Clara Valley. I don't have them, but you do. The orange sulfur, silvery blue, two-banded checkered skipper, western tail blue, um, eastern tail blue, the large marble, the serge orange tip, and the water ball blue. They use so many of those same plants, the lupines, the deerweed, the peas, um, they, the, the wallflowers. These are, these are great butterflies. And the grasslands. So if you think about where grasslands were located, dunes and dune scrub, it's really obvious. They're over by the coast. But for grasslands, those are areas that people like to live and build houses and build schools and build um, build buildings for industry because they're sort of flat and sunny and they're not as foggy um, and they're not as, um, that they don't vary as much as say oak woodland might. And so the grassland got taken up and built on pretty fast. And so we have a lot of grassland butterflies, not only because some of them use the grasses, but also because our grasslands and prairies actually have a lot of flowers in them. And those grassland plants are very drought tolerant, very, very drought tolerant. The Bay Checker Spot uses one tiny little plant that is an annual. I don't even know how it managed to evolve, co-evolve with a plant where it's just got the annual leaves, but it's one of the reasons that it is federally endangered, um, there is one tiny little community left somewhere in San Mateo County. Um, we're trying to reintroduce it to um, San Francisco. It That uh, Pontago erecta specifically prefers serpentine soil um, and serpentine grasslands. So full sun, serpentine soil, it's amazing. San Bruno Elfin uses one of, um, uses the stone crop and the monarch which isn't federally endangered yet. Yay, because you, Santa Clara Valley, have been planting milkweed. It uses milkweed, but it is, it is threatened. Um, but look at all the other gorgeous butterflies we have that use fescue and um, bent grass and wild rye and sedge. In it, and those are wonderful. Um, grassland plants, they're grasses, so they've got seeds that feed birds but they don't produce any nectar or pollen. And so they grow with a whole bunch of gorgeous flowering plants, the mallows and lomatium and goldenrod. And we've got a lot of butterflies that co-evolved in the grassland. It's sunny and not as windy as the coast. The gray, the gray buckeye and the royal skipper and the sockum and the Northern checker spot and Edith checker spot and the Pacific dotted blue that are using poppies and monkey flowers and goldenrod. Uh, these are, they're gorgeous butterflies and they want to come to your garden. We've got more moths than butterflies in the oak woodland. And all I can think is that there just isn't as much sun. So it's not as sunny, so it's not as warm, so it's not as friendly. But we do have a bunch of butterflies that are dependent on the local oak. California sister and the mournful dusky wing and the pro, is it propertius dusky wing? All use the oak, as does the California tortoiseshell that can also use the cenopus. Um, we've got the, tail, the tailed copper on that current. Some of our currents are uh, dune scrub and some of them are oak woodland understory. We've got the pale tiger swallowtail that can fly back and forth between the coffee berry that is a very shade tolerant under oak woodland understory plant and back and forth to the chaparral area where there's cyanothus. 
California Dogface is our official butterfly, um, state butterfly in California. It only uses one plant, the false indigo, and so it's federally endangered. Um, the pipevine swallowtail is locally rare. It is in some areas that still have pipevine. You've got more of it in Santa Clara Valley than I've got in San Francisco, but we are trying to restore it. And the pipe vine is an extremely shade tolerant plant, but it does want some water to get started. Um, very easy to grow. Very easy to grow, I wouldn't be able to grow it. The Western tiger swallowtail is an amazing butterfly. It's got a lot of energy, as does the pipe vine, by the way. Uh, just a lot of energy to fly back and forth. And it seems to really like tall trees, oaks and cherries and maples and willows. And the you know, the silk moth is one of our gorgeous moths that uses the oak and the, the cherry and the cenothus. So riparian is a fancy word for creekside. We have a bunch of butterflies. The, the pipe vine, you could water it all year long. It will be fine. Um, it will grow more the more you water it. So it's considered both an oak woodland and a, and a riparian plant. We've got this incredible plant called the violet, the viola. There are violets in England and Europe. Ours are somewhat similar, but it's our, um, it's this amazing plant, this amazing caterpillar plant for three federally endangered butterflies, the variable checker spot, the calliope silver spot and the myrtle's silver spot. Um, there is, uh, there are butterflies all the way all the way up to Oregon and all the way down to San Diego that use the dog violet. It's it's a very easy understory plant. Um, flat, it gets to the size of a of a serving plate. Um, we can eat those leaves and we can eat the flowers. Most of the violets really need a lot of water. The dog violet is a drought tolerant one, although it would really appreciate some water through the first two or three summers and, and then it's it's drought tolerant and then it's summer deciduous actually. The Coronis fritillary also uses the violet. It's just not that endangered yet, yay. Um, and then the willow, which is the keystone species use over 300, feeds over 300 different caterpillar species with its leaves, the morning cloak and the satyrkana and the Western tiger swallowtail all use those willow leaves. Mylita crescent um, uses monkey flower. And honestly, I think the Mylita crescent is also federally endangered. I need to modify that. And then we've got wetland butterflies. We've got the Western pygmy blue and we've got the purplish, purplish copper that evolved with the specific plants. Um, purplish copper in our not salt tolerant plants, Western pygmy blue with our salt tolerant plants. So those are our, um, our butterflies as they are arranged in plant communities, but how would we use them in the garden? So we're gonna talk about the number of butterfly, moth and caterpillar species fed by, fed by those plants leaves. There's a little clock if something is long blooming, which is three months or longer. Does it need more water or actually quite a bit of water? We'll note that. So we'll look at ground covers, shorter flowers, grasses, compact shrubs, bigger shrubs, vines, trees, and container plants. Keep in mind, these plants feed butterfly caterpillars. We have way more plants that are wonderful as ground covers. Oops. So we've got um, seaside daisy is really great. It can handle a lot of different um, soils and although it is it is a dune scrub plant i've got it planted on clay and if you give it water it will just continue to bloom eight or nine months worth of bloom california sagebrush is wonderful there is a flat version of that and that does seem to continue to feed caterpillars we've got a couple of different strawberry species the beach strawberry has genetics in the supermarket strawberry Beach strawberry needs sandy soil and full sun. The woodland strawberry, understory oak woodland, the farther you get to the understory, the darker the plant can, can um, manage. 
it can take a lot of shade. And so I've seen a lot of people um, want to thank that East Bay Garden Tour for just the number of people who are using woodland strawberry as a shady ground cover. It's just great. California lilac comes in a lot of different shapes. There are ground covers, there are shrubs, and there are trees. And um, these are just the species that are great for ground covers. And then California aster, it blooms for two months, so it doesn't get a, a little clock, but it is a wonderful plant and it's a specialist bee plant, as is that seaside daisy. And we do have some some plants that are summer deciduous. So that violet is summer deciduous. If it stops getting water, it'll still live underground. But checker bloom is gorgeous. Just a really friendly um, pink blossom. The more water it got during the rainy season, the longer it'll bloom. Creeping snowberry and rock press, uh, rock press. Creeping snowberry can take a lot of shade, a lot, a lot of shade. It's understory oak woodland. And that harlequin lotus that is absolutely gorgeous. I just want sandy soil. So anyway, I'm envious, envious of all of you people who have sandy soil and can grow it. We have wonderful grasses. Take a look at that picture from the Oakland Museum. Look at how big those uh, and, and how long and how great those grass roots are. That is storing a lot of carbon underground as are most of our plants, except for our annuals and wild, uh, wildflowers. The rest of them are really storing carbon underground and we don't need to just plant trees. We can plant trees with understory or we can plant grasses and grassland plants. If what you've got is a lot of sun and you'll support just wonderful butterflies, so many grasses can support so many butterflies. And there are some of those, a few of those, the the red fescue, um, the bunch grasses, you can mow for a very drought tolerant lawn replacement. Shorter flowers, um, yarrow you can mow. You won't get the benefits of the flowers, but you will still get those leaves. That dot seed plantain is that one plant, that one annual that the um, bay checker spot needs. The sunflowers are amazing in terms of specialist bees. Um, yampa is what that anise swallowtail was eating, um, as was that lomatium. That's what those, those caterpillars were eating before we showed up with fennel and dill. California um, poppies also support a variety of butterflies. Shorter plants, so I'm talking three feet and lower. Um, clover and sink oil and sea pink and the wallflowers and the deerweed. Um, deerweed so amazing for some of our um, rare and threatened butterflies. And shorter flowers that can, that can manage some shade. For those of you who have cow parsnip in your, in your garden already, and you have extra cow parsnip because it seeds really freely, please put, if you want someone to come and dig extra cow parsnip out of your garden, please put your, your location, what city you're in, and contact information, and people will come and help move cow parsnip out. Um, bee plant spreads by rhizomes. You can end up with a lot of that if you want some of that moved out of your garden. Um, again, consider putting your contact information in rough location, city name, and people can contact you and come get free plants out of your garden. And, um, more compact plants. So buckwheat and mil milkweed, thistle is amazing, um, not only for, uh, for the caterpillars, but also for specialist bees. And I did not realize that hummingbirds liked the nectar in that. Um, bees love it, specialist bees love it, hummingbirds love it, that is good to know. And those evergreen plants, um, California sagebrush is amazing and it smells wonderful. And there is mugwort that can take a lot of shade. It's actually understory oak woodland. And then our, our lupines are so important. Um, and the California lilacs are so important. And the, the monkey flowers are important for some of our uh, dune scrub bees, especially the monkey flower and the lupine for the dune scrub. Evergreen plants that can handle all kinds of sun and shade. There's the goldenrod. That 
that coffee berry, I have got it in some very deep shade. Red berry can handle very deep shade. Huckleberry, very deep shade. And deciduous plants that can take some shade. Some of our currants um, can take shade, including the pink flowering currant and the red flowering currant. The false indigo can take some shade. The, the California roses can take some shade. They do have a lot of thorns. I'm not fond of thorny plants myself, but if you don't mind thorns, it's, it's an amazing plant. Um, snowberry, there's that flat version we talked about earlier. There are taller shrubs as well. And then ocean spray can take a lot of fog, a lot of wind and, and some amount of shade. Dutchman's pipe vine, that can take a lot of shade. Um, the peas and the clematis would prefer full sun. So you've got oaks I just don't have. I only have Corsus argofolia, but you've got some gorgeous oaks. And the beak leaf maple, it does want some water. Um, Toyon is really bulletproof, drought tolerant, all the way down past Los Angeles. Pacific Madrone, very drought tolerant. And the Toyon of the Pacific Madrone have got those long lasting um, berries. They don't drop them. The, the birds, migrating birds especially, will show up to eat those berries. We've got a bunch of trees that are great for sand, wind, and fog, and that is holly leaf cherry, the coast silk tassel, tassel, and the California wax myrtle. California wax myrtle is going to want some more water. Um, I, San Francisco Rack and Park has put that some places where it's not going to get the water it needs, but they haven't died yet. So yay, they are medium water use plants. If you've got an irrigated area, that's a great tree to have. All three of these can take a lot of wind and fog. And chaparral trees. So there are tree forms of the California lilac. There's tree forms of the manzanita, um, the mountain mahogany and the flannel bush. These are all great. Um, I have got dermatology issues with, flan with flannel bush um, where I weed it underneath and wonder why I itch. I hear that mountain mahogany does too. It's a really beautiful plant, but you may have dermatology issues. I do want to caution you with the manzanita. Um, in one of our newer parks, they put in three different forms of manzanita. They put in one of the tree forms, they put in one of the bushes, and then they put in a local one, the Franciscan manzanita, which used to be incredibly rare. Uh, it was the rarest plant in the world for a while. And now it's in the nursery trade. And I can tell which manzanita the Franciscan manzanita is because that's the one that is getting all the insect activity. So try to get a manzanita or choose a manzanita that not only meets your soil and sun and shape needs, but really think about that in terms of whether or not the, the leaves are going to get chewed on. Um, I, I specifically need that manzanita because of the December, January, and February bloom supporting those early arriving queen bumblebees. But I want to balance that with the fact that it would support over 60 different caterpillars if I if I gave, if I were using one of the local, one of my local manzanita, manzanitas. And to be able to see that so clearly in Francisco Park is one of those, one of those teachable moments to me. And riparian. I mean, there's there's willows, the Arroyo Willow is all the way down to Los Angeles, but it is in those seasonal creeks. Um, I have one in a seep. It it hasn't. It's big, it's gotten really big, but it hasn't really moved out of that seep. We do have trees with edible parts for people. The holly leaf cherries got edible cherries. The blue elderberry and the black elderberry, which is inland in California, um, have both got edible berries that are gorgeous. I mean, the, the California hazelnut is just gorgeous, but it's gonna want some water. Um, it's got a beautiful shape. It's got a... Um, fall color. It's got delicious edible leaves, uh, nuts. It just kind of needs some water. Um, Northern California walnut, I hear needs some water. I don't know if anybody online uh, or on Zoom is already growing that. And um, all of the pine nuts. So not the cypress 
and not the redwoods, but the pines. If you are absolutely certain you've got a pine, those nuts are edible. And in Santa Clara Valley, you've got the bishop pine. We have no native pines in San Francisco, um, even though people planted them there. But all of those pine nuts are edible. You can grow caterpillar plants in containers. There are lupine annuals um, that um, Cedum spathifolium is, it wants cactus mix. It wants a very fast draining soil because it's used to being on a rocky wall, but you can put it in a container. That little dot seed plantain that we were talking about, that, that can grow in containers. And Chinese houses also grows in containers. These are really nice plants. We have way more plants than this, than this that grow in containers, but these are ones that specifically feed caterpillars with their leaves. And I wasn't really gonna talk a lot of nectar plants, but for some reason, the blue dicks that are, I guess now known as blue dips, anyway, um, dip terastemon, it seems to be a favorite nectar plant for adult butterflies on iNaturalist. I, I got so many different kinds of butterflies that all use that. So it's something to consider. It's just a really small bulb, easy to grow in containers. Wants full sun and it's gorgeous. Please, please plant that year round buffet if you are snow and frost free. Um, and for if you have, if you have snow and frost, please plan to have as long a bloom as you can. We saw the adult butterfly buffet earlier. We're going to look at bees and hummingbirds and, and people. Um, when we feed people with edible native plants, that's called ethnobotany. Those native plant buffets are feeding our caterpillars and those caterpillars are feeding the rest of our ecosystem. And so these are very long, if, if you choose them, if you choose for that long bloom, you will get it. Um, unbelievably helpful to bees. And our hummingbirds have got a lot of choices of things that they could eat. Again, they don't want to migrate. They want to stay in your garden and fight with you and all the other hummingbirds and critters for access to your flowers. And people, there's all kinds of things that we can eat. Um, thanks to the information that we have, uh, we've got seeds and flowers and fruit and nuts and greens, um, just amazing the number of things that we can eat. There are some great resources online. Doug Tallamy, Best Practices, Plant those keystone species, plant a variety of local native plants. He doesn't have things planted in, in plant communities, but he's based in Delaware. Um, we know better here in California. Please plant in plant communities when you can and plant for those um, specialist pollinators and caterpillars and leave some leaves on the ground. Um, those caterpillars in their, in their cocoons look like dead leaves for a reason. They're trying not to get eaten by birds when they're in their cocoons. Coordinate with your neighbors, Please don't, don't spray insecticide or herbicide and build a conservation hard, hardscape. Consider um, using motion sensors and consider installing a water, a water bubbler, especially if you want to, um, to see a lot of birds. A friend of mine in Virginia has got a heater in her three water bubblers so that she can have birds in the winter. Advocate for native plants, remove your lawn and remove invasive species. Calscape is a wonderful plant selection tool. It does have a 10 mile radius. And so you're gonna to need to check, um, check the soil type. So many of those plants are very specific. California lilac and the manzanitas are very specific about their soil types. It also includes native plant nurseries and I, I find it really easy to use. We have a lot of plant lists um, in San Francisco because I don't wanna to have to look up things more than once, um, including colorful plants. California Native Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley also has butterfly gardening directly uh, available on your website. And just so many groups that you can go off and specifically garden for butterflies. But I strongly recommend you, you join a very local group 
The two green spaces that I steward are a block and a half and then two blocks from me. It's, I know that I'm too lazy to get in my car and go somewhere, um, at least on a regular basis. So consider taking an existing neighborhood group or starting a neighborhood group and um, having them remove invasive plants and add natives. So thank you so much to all the people who took all the pictures. We are the California Native Plant Society. We have free lectures, free hikes, restoration, advocacy. Um, thank you for planting for caterpillars. Let's take some questions. Jennifer, do you have the questions or should I look in the chat? Um, is it Arvin? just pulling those up and uh, they're still kind of rolling in too. So let me uh, take a quick look at the um, list that uh, Arvind has so kindly been tracking. So yeah, one, um, one question came up. Actually, someone said, uh, we have bees that like to eat meat. Does anyone know if they're also pollinators or only eat carrion? Um, and there was a little bit of chat about, you know, the bees versus wasps. So I thought, I thought you might want to take a moment to talk about, and then I think there's native wasps and then there are imported, are the yellow jackets, the ones that are imported. Maybe you can address that a little bit. Yellow jackets. Sorry to interject, but, um, Susan, maybe if you stopped sharing, it might be easier if people, I love this cartoon. It's adorable, but I, would, <laughs> I think we'd like to see your face too. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, um, if we happen to have a native wasp expert, um, please raise your hand so that Jennifer can go up, uh, have you talk rather than me. So bees and wasps are cousins. And if they go to Thanksgiving together, bees are the ones who are bringing the blueberry pie and the desserts. The, and the, the um, but, but wasps eat meat. I've had lunch in a variety of places where I'm, eating something with chicken or something. And I've had a wasp land on my plate, roll some up and fly off with it. Mm. That's likely one of our native, native wasps. Um, our native wasps are stingless, but don't count on being able to tell a native wasp from a non-native wasp. Assume they're going to sting and assume that they're there to, to eat meat. That wasp was completely uninterested when we got dessert. It was only interested in the meat on the plate. Mm. And so at this point, when I see wasps, I, I take tiny pieces of, of protein and I move them to the edge of the plate so that they can fly back and forth. That's what they not only feed themselves, but it's what they feed their babies. So. Right, they, right. And, and I, I've i even at a, at a bigger picnic or whatever, even put it like, oh, now I can't remember what's upwind or downwind. Um, but you put it so that they get to that meat before they get to you. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. that's, that's a really good idea. Yeah. They, they eat meat and they're so easily confused with honeybees. They, mm -hmm. they really look similar. Yeah. Um, another question was, uh, someone was asking, how do you sanitize rainwater um, that's captured to prevent the growth of bacteria? And someone did answer that it's not, you don't need to sanitize it. Just collect it in barrels that aren't clear. If you use semi-transparent containers, then you can buy or make canvas covers for them. And that IBC containers last longer or just use tanks that are made for rain collection and not clear. I don't know if you have any, if you, did you mention rain collection? I'm sorry if I missed it or. Oh, yes, I did. I'm, yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> on, I'm on a rain collection thing. This is, rain collection is the difference between us being able to continue to garden and us not being able to continue to garden during climate change. Um, the more rain we collect, the less water we are taking out of the variety of, of limited water resources that we yeah. have. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, someone else asked if you um, if your soil should be amended when you're planting native plants. Do you need to do any kind of amendments or any uh, any kind of treatment of your soil? So I used to say no, um, and I know we've got a lot of other great um, resources, other people to to speak on this site. If it's sand you don't do it. If it's clay or if it looks like it's been scraped um, to make the land flat, then there's no topsoil anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I used to think you didn't need to amend it, but you're going to get better growth if you do. Good. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, someone asked about how do you find out about your soil type? And I don't know if there's a 
a simple guide that you use, or if you send soil, some people send soil away to be analyzed. I never went, I'm too lazy. <laughs> do you have any thoughts about how do you know what type of soil you have? Um, uh, take, take a spoon and stick it into your soil. Um, and then pour some water and take the spoon and stick it into your soil. And, and then, because uh, actually in this, in this time of year in August, nothing's, nothing's going to enter the soil. <laughs> um, I have to use water to get into yeah. it before I dig it all. Um, but once you can get a little ball of soil in your hand, if it just feels grainy, you likely have sand. Um, if it's just kind of clumpy and the water just kind of pools, you likely have clay. Mm. If it's green rock, it's serpentine. If it's sort of a whitish creamy rock, it's sandstone slash gray wacky. Who comes up with these names? <laughs> and, um, we have another, we have another soil type. It's so crazy. Chert. Oh, which is kind of an, uh, pinky Brown. Mm. And, oh, great. Yeah. And so, so if when you stick a spoon or a spade into it and it makes kind of a clangy noise, mm -hmm. you have, you have some kind of rock, but it's yeah. really easy to tell from the color. Yeah. And, and then one answer on, um, from the group was that there are videos and other web information on how to determine if your soil is basically sand, loam, or uh, clay. And so, um, and then uh, another person's ch uh, chiming in with the geological names, like you mentioned. So those are, there's a little chat going on around this as well. Um, the National Park Service has got some really informa interesting information about the different um, formations. Mm -hmm. um, the National Park Service, uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. If you go look up Chert or Gray Wacky or one of those, you'll get all of their information. They've got some great information for schools too. Okay. And that's where I learned it. I'm like, ah, I am hearing these names, but I don't know what they mean. <laughs> well, and I, I wanted to flip back to the question about wasps because I did see that Marav Vonshok who's an entomologist at San Jose State, uh, chimed in and said, in general, wasps feed their larvae animal-based protein and bees feed their larvae on pollen and nectar. In the tropics, some stingless bees collect fluids from carrion though. So there's a, a difference there. So thank you, Marav, for being the expert in the room on that. <laughs> Would you like to speak up on that? Because I am not. Oh, uh, do we want to unmute Marav? Do, does she want to, you want yeah. to speak Marav? If it's possible. Or not. Or not. <laughs> she might not let her do it. I don't it. know how to unmute oh, people. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's see. People, if people we... should be able to unmute themselves. I, it's not um, fixed that everybody okay. muted. Okay. I didn't want to put anybody on the spot either. If Marav, if Marav doesn't want to talk more about wasps and bees. I, oh, hi. Oh, sorry. I stepped out. <laughs> I didn't oh. hear you. Busted. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. What did you say? Oh, we were just talking a little bit about the the bees versus wasps, and Susan wondered if you wanted to to say more. It was that some of your perspective was fascinating, and um, anyway, um, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I was just uh, coordinating okay. something. Uh, but yeah, in general, bees uh, feed their lava with um, plant based protein. So I mean, the uh, nectar and pollen, and they make the bee cake. Um, and then wasps use uh, animal-based protein, so that's why they'll steal your, you know, meat from your sandwich or caterpillars or you know different things they can find. But I think both groups, which are, as you said, closely related, are closely related. The adults feed on nectar because they just need, you know, quick sugars to get by and fly and do all those things. But yeah. they need the protein. Uh, to feed their lava so they can develop. Okay, so so in doing so, are they kind of incidental pollinators as they're as they're feeding themselves? The adults are eating nectar. Are they? Yeah, also so they're, they're really good pollinators. Some of them. They're not probably not as good as bees, but I mean, if you watch flowers and it seems like you did, then you probably notice a high diversity of wasps that feed on nectar and would often visit the same flowers that are not as specific as bees or honeybees or some of our, you know, specialized bees. But yeah, there are many 
great pollinators other than bees and wasps. We, I mean, obviously butterflies, but also many fly species and beetles and many other insects are important pollinators and different flowers are adapted to different pollinators. Fascinating. Oh, well, thank, thank you for yeah. sharing that and, and your perspective. And I just had one more quick question about wasps. I know there's like 1600 uh, approximately bee species. Does that include that wasps would be a different category? Do you know how many mm -hmm. types there are in California of wasps? I don't know the number, but it should be much higher. So bees are a small family within the Hymenoptera group that in, also include ants uh, that are more closely related to wasps. But wasps are a huge group. So many of them are tiny parasitic wasps and some of them make the awesome galls on plants. Uh, and some of them parasitize those galls on the plants and parasitize everything else. So there are many um, described species mm -hmm. of galls and other wasps. So it's it's a really huge and diverse group and very interesting. Well, that's great. I'm so glad we have you on the call to answer these really uh, <laughs> go deep on the complex questions around entomology. So that's that's really nice. We're honored. Yeah, thank, thank you. So much. And thanks for the great presentation. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for, for talking about that in an impromptu way. I will <laughs> <talk into it. laughs> oh, um, So I didn't, I didn't see, um, does, do other people want to chime in? Don't be shy with more. Um, oh, so someone did ask, is there an invasive wasp affecting monarch caterpillars that we need to watch for? Um, and I don't know, Marav, you want to, I'm aware that there's the, isn't the imported wasp one of the ones that's, um, it's a non-native wasp that is is doing is parasitizing monarch caterpillars and probably many others we're not aware of. I'm not sure. I would actually assume that if someone is parasitizing monarchs, it should be a local species because they should have co-evolved together. Usually these species are highly specific, but I'm I don't know. So yeah. maybe I shouldn't say that. But okay. then there are other things that might eat your uh, monarch caterpillars or eggs, uh, even ladybug. Uh, adults or lava, or maybe both, they feed sometimes on uh, the younger uh, caterpillars and, and the eggs. Nature is messy. <laughs> yes, and fun. <laughs> yes. Um, good. Um, let's see. I'm just checking for more questions. Um, uh, I think we've covered everything, I've, everything I'm able to see. I don't think I missed anything. Um, were there some additional thoughts, Susan, that you had? You had such a wonderful presentation. It's very thorough. So, um, but uh, I know we still have a little bit of time. I'm actually curious about, I know that you're doing a project with a local park that you mentioned, and did you lead a tour through that already, or you have a tour coming up? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, I led a tour on Saturday. It was, or Sunday. It was a beautiful day, which was kind of strange. Um, it was sunny and warm. It was odd. And so, uh, yeah, I death marched people. It, it's supposed to be Russian Hill, but um, it's got a lot of smaller hills that we, we saw a lot of oak woodland. It's a lot of clay and shirt with a lot of sand and dune scrub at the end. And uh, a lot of good questions. A lot of people out there propagating plants. And because we have put a lot of these plants into areas that are um, not San Francisco Rec and Park because we wouldn't take a, a seed from that, but the San Francisco Public Works areas where we're adding plants, I feel I felt comfortable giving people seed envelopes and just saying, yeah, here's what this plant is. Go ahead and take all the seed you need or come back and get seed later. A lot of people are interested in propagation. It is one of those things I am really terrible at, but there's people out there who can do it and love to do it. And I'm so appreciative. Um, we have someone who's propagating in, we have nine backyard propagators, one of whom has 40 small pipeline plants. So looking forward to seeing those um, end up in gardens just across the city and elsewhere. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I do wanna encourage people if they don't think that they're good propagators, if you just have a little patch and you throw some little seeds down when it's rainy in like November, and just see what happens. It, it can be kind of amazing and, and rewarding, even if you don't feel like you've got a green thumb. Um, someone, I did get another question here. Let me grab this. Someone says they get caterpillars in their sand. Do other people get caterpillars in their soil? Um, 
caterpillars in the sand. I can't imagine they're butterfly caterpillars. So you'll have, we've got um, ground nesting bees. 70% of our bees are ground nesting and a lot of them are sand nesting specific. There's a silver digger bee that we thought was extinct. And when the Presidio took ice plant out of their dunes and replaced it with native plants, the silver digger bees came back. They, they're generalist bees in terms of what they eat, but they're specialist bees in terms of habitat. Actually, all bees are specialist in terms of habitat. Mm. They live in the ground. They live in stems. Um, they live in wood. Um, but 70% in ground, because this way, if a fire comes through, hey, you're still fine. Yeah. And um, and so the silver digger, digger bees are just specifically in sand. I So, I mean... The silver digger bee babies would be caterpillars in sand. <laughs> I don't know who else. Maybe grubs are, can be young moths, right? Like moths can be in the, yes. I, I, I was digging underneath my, I have a um, gooseberry. So um, a ribes, oh my goodness. Now I'm going to blank on the name, but um, ribes, not sanguineum. Um, anyway, um, but I, I was digging under my gooseberry and I dug up a, a pretty sizable chunky caterpillar. So it, I don't know what, I don't know enough about caterpillars to know what it was doing in the ground, but hiding uh, from birds. I mean, I, I, I don't know if they all make cocoons. Um, maybe they do their transformation underneath. Are there, uh, is there Marav or, or some other <laughs> expert <laughs> about this than me? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, I don't know what you saw, but there's like the big white grubs that you sometimes find in compost or in your yard, these are uh, beetle larva that feed on roots and they're big and white and they have very small legs and, you know, they're mostly white, just their head is, is small, robust, it's kind of brown mm -hmm. and they're really cool. But those are beetle larva. Interesting. Yeah, so Cute. the wasp and bee larva, they, I guess most species would completely depend on getting their food from an adult. So Usually they would leave that. Most bees and wasps are not social, so they don't take care of their young, but they just leave the food and let them do their thing. But so they should be in some sort of a nest. Okay. Mm -hmm. But maybe, I mean, while digging, you might destroy that without even noticing. Because uh, many bees, as you mentioned, nest in the ground, but also uh, some wasps. We have sand wasps that are amazing to watch, and mm -hmm. those nest in sand as well. Mm -hmm. Marvelous. Thank you. Fascinating. I, I'd like to actually suggest that if Cindy, you want to unmute and ask your question, because this is Cindy asking Marav, just uh, any other. Cindy does know the difference between larva and caterpillars, which is why I was thinking she might want to, if she wanted to, if you wanted to add something. Oh, sorry, she can't unmute. All right. Oh. But Cindy was clear that she, I mean, because she does know enough to know okay. the difference between larva and caterpillars. Yeah, so I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I'm sure there might be some caterpillars in the sand. I just don't know where they are. And I kept thinking about bees and wasps, but of course, they have all these different caterpillars. Um, I know that many moth and possibly others uh, when they need to make their pupa to, you know, when they're done growing and they need to make their pupa or sometimes a cocoon, they will leave the plant and go uh, underground. And sometimes when you dig, you might find this brown uh, pupa, which if you keep them in a box with a way to emerge, you might see the moth emerging mm -hmm. from that. Um, so sometimes you'll see the caterpillar just before it made its pupa. I don't have an idea for something else right now, but there might be other things. And Cindy just mentioned something that's an interest, another interesting resource. Um, she was, she's was commenting that she's going to start posting on the Insect Museum of California, which is a yeah, Facebook. Yeah, perfect. And, and so for those of you who don't know about it, if you're on Facebook, look up for Insect Museum of California because it's a really great group, of lots of very knowledgeable people. And if you share pictures there, there's usually somebody who really knows their stuff who can help with that. So just a, another resource. Wow. 
They have an area B ways project on iNaturalist that I'm obsessed with. The, the Insect Museum of California. Okay, and that's on Facebook only or it's a website? You know, I only pay attention to it on Facebook, so oh. I can't answer that off the top of my head. Marab, do you know? <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a Facebook group, oh. but it's terrific. There are lots of local uh, experts, so you can get oh. information about our local species. Did not know that. That's fabulous. And I, I, I actually have a question for you, Susan, because um, I don't actually know how much of a garden you have. We haven't visited each other's gardens, but it, you've mentioned during your talk a couple of favorite plants here and there. But do, when you look at your garden, are you just like, I'm so glad I planted, you know, like just a favorite child you could pick from the... <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. Um, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with the California onions. They're little bulbs. They're entirely edible. Um, the one leaf onion has this gorgeous pink blossom. I'm one of those people that plants every possible pink thing and, um, and they're entirely edible. So the seeds, the flowers, the leaves, I haven't eaten the bulb yet because then I wouldn't get the seeds, the flowers and the leaves, but <laughs> Yeah, completely obsessed with the California onion. Wow, just... I would not have guessed that. I was thinking you mentioned co coffee berry at one point. I'm like, oh, she looks at, at that shrub. I've got that's what's being eaten the most in my yard. So I'm excited about that. But it is I'm gonna try those. I have none. I have no bulbs. So I gotta get cracking. Oh yeah. So the Tridley Alaxa, the Ethereal Spear, and the um elegant brodiaea both have edible flowers. Um you have to cook those bulbs. And again, I'd have to get rid of the bulb and I don't want to, but yeah, it's really fun to eat the flowers and it's really fun to put edible flowers on top of the salad. It yes. makes me feel extra fancy. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered if anybody else wanted to post in chat, do they have like an absolute favorite or, you know, I always want to know what's eating your plants. Like does, Susan, do you have plants in your garden that are being particularly eaten or you see getting eaten a lot? I, it really varies from place to place. Thimbleberry is another plant I absolutely adore. It's in the raspberry family. It doesn't have any thorns. I talked about how I don't like thorny plants because I don't, mm -hmm. but the whole rubus family seems to get eaten. I've got a salmonberry in the backyard that um, really gets the leaves get eaten and, um, and the berries are tasty. I think the thimbleberries are more delicious than did, did I mention no thorns and it's rhizomes. Um, it, not right for um, a formal garden because it's really going to spread, mm -hmm. but have put that in uh, some different gardens, including some school gardens. And I'm really seeing a, a big differences in predation mm -hmm. in terms of which la leaves get eaten oh. in, in which gardens. Yeah. That's and so that's pretty fascinating. Interesting. And have you done a lot of work with school gardens? Is that something you're, are you seeing growth in that area where you are or? Getting a lot of questions about that. We are getting a lot of questions from um, teachers who want to be able to to get kids outside and just have them have a, an experience away from sitting at a desk and listening. Yeah, yeah. the kids really seem to enjoy it, and um, and so every school teacher that re reaches out to us, we donate plants. Oh, amazing! Oh, that's great! Oh, that's yeah. excellent! Excellent! That's right. You guys have that wonderful plants giving program, don't you? It, oh, do you mind that? sharing that? Yeah. Oh, Yerba Buena has. Susan, go ahead. Plants giving. <laughs> Let's all do that. <laughs> We're looking for a better name, but that's the name we've got for now. So, January of 2020, we thought, what if, or, or it might have been a little earlier, we thought, what if we um, grew some plants and gave them away? And we could get more native plants into places because plants cost money. And so we just did California sagebrush, Artemisia californica, and we're able to give a lot of it away. And that kept us really able to stay in touch with community groups during the pandemic, because this, this was just right before. Mm -hmm. And then 
we did a, another couple of years of growing out different kinds of plants, um, specifically, and we got permission from San Bruno Mountain because it's the same, it's got the similar enough genetics to us. We got permission from the San Mateo uh, County Parks and San Bruno Mountain to do the collecting there. And so that's where we collected all of those plants. We had them grow, grown out. We did a year with blue elderberry and coffee berry and Cenothus thrissiflorus, our only local um, Cenothus. And so we have been growing different plants each year and giving them away. And this year we decided to focus on our backyard growers because we can just get a bigger variety of things. We've got six different kinds of soil. Ooh. So we've got serpentine groups and sand groups and sandstone groups oh. groups. And so it's been, we, we haven't started that yet. That'll be, we're actually probably going to put that off till January. Um, and that's when we'll be be giving things away to community groups, but we'll we'll start giving plants away to schools just as soon as they ask. That's perfect. I love how native plants map to the school year, actually. You know, when you think about planting in the fall and you know, they kind of hunker down over the summer, you know, it's it can be a really nice cycle. Um, so good, good for you for doing that. I had no idea about that program. Yeah, I mean, you guys are giving away seeds and um, we do have some of our backyard growers. I know you you buy your seeds from learners. Um, and if you're in Southern California, you should buy it from, from Theodore Payne or one of the other groups that's um, got more oh, Southern cool. genetics. I mean, we've got Seed Hunt, we've got SNS up here. We've got some really good seed providers. Mm -hmm. But oh. we're giving away um, mostly plants and then we've got some um, backyard growers who collect seeds for us. We've got a guy that gave away wine cup Clarkia last year. Oh, always great. looking for they're gorgeous. Did I mention pink and gorgeous? <laughs> and they can take a lot of shade. Yeah. No. Yeah, they're in Larner's shade mix. So if you want a good idea about shade plants, you could just look at what they what they sell. Um, but you bring up a really good point about local ecotyping. And I know Hedgerow Farms is another one. They sell in bulk. So if you're buying large amounts. I think it has to be like $250 minimum order, but, um, you know, and, and learners is finally open on Saturdays. So if people want to go to Bolinas on a Saturday, I highly recommend uh, going to learners demonstration garden, buying your seeds, and then going to Coast Cafe for lunch. <laughs> I, I had heard there was a good cafe and I hear there's a good bakery too near there. Yeah. And you guys have reminded me about something that I wanted to mention. I should have had a slide on it at the beginning is we do not have the final date yet, but we are bringing back our seed exchange and propagation talk. So that's going to be sometime in November. So those of you, this is a good time to collect seeds, collect up your seeds because sometime in November, we'll be announcing this once we get the final, the date finalized, we will have a propagation talk. It's probably going to be at the Cupertino library and that will include a seed exchange. So you don't, for our seed exchanges, you don't have to bring seeds to exchange yourself, but to exchange, but, but if you happen to have any, and this is a good time to collect them, you know, it's a really fun thing to share seeds with other people. And so just keep that in mind um, because our, we'll be doing that again this year. It's so exciting to be able to do these things again. Yeah, that's fabulous. I, I haven't been involved in one of those except like at a table at an event, but that's really having it all centered around that. That's exciting. So I have an update, late breaking. Uh, the seed exchange is confirmed for Thursday, November 9th at the Cupertino Library Program Room. Oh, breaking news. I like this. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Thank you. this is the place to be, huh? <laughs> this place has everything. And, and I'm so appreciative of the fact that Santa Clara Valley has got your own nursery so that you've got those local genetics for people too. Um, I... I spend a lot of time just talking about which plants. There are a lot of rare plants. Um, there are rare plant communities like vernal pools. There are people who are really deep into conservation. And I see the easier plants, the California lilacs and the manzanita and the, and the coffee berries and honestly the onions <laughs> the, <laughs> <laughs> as those gateway plants to the plants that, that just take a lot more effort in conservation. And so I really appreciate those of you out there who are working on making sure that we've got um, those, those open pollinated, um, locally conserved genetics and, and those really rare plants. Since I, I manage our 
nursery, I, I do have to put a slight qualifier in there in that our nursery has plants from all over the state. We do have some that are very local. Uh, actually, one of the reasons we have some of the plants we do is are due to some of the people who are on the call on on the Zoom tonight. Um, you know who you are. <laughs> and, uh, but we do have plants from all over the state. And so just, but we try to make it obvious um, in the naming of the plant um, when they come, if they come from a local source. Like we do have, we'll have yarrow that originated at Edward Park. Um, we have a number of plants from Mount Amanam and there are other, there are other ones that are in that category. So that sounds but great. We are actually a little bit past nine. Yeah. So it's uh we and we said we were gonna end at nine, but I we could go on. <laughs> really, we don't have to stop. But I um I did I, I just wanted to throw this slide back up just of what we have coming up for those of you who want to participate in some of the August activities that our chapter is gonna be having, the habitat restoration, the walk over on the co uh, on the coast, and our photo group meeting. And then our library talk in person. So it'd be great to see some of you in person. Mm -hmm. um, and are there, and, and I just wanted to say thank you again so much for doing this, uh, Susan. You're such a wonderful speaker. I love looking at your slides. They're just beautiful. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for, for joining us and mm -hmm. sharing your knowledge, sharing, you know, getting people together to talk about actions and what we can do as a, a group because connections, you know, that's the way we get the word out, amplify, each of us can amplify this. We, we all have our own interests and skills and expertise and ways we want to grow and ways we're not even sure we want to grow, but we want to try mm -hmm. and having each other to support us. I mean, together we are a force of nature. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautifully said. <laughs> All right, and on that note, then that is that very wonderful note. I am going to be ending the Zoom session. So thank you all for showing up, and stay tuned. We will have more more of these talks coming up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Susan. Fabulous talk. <laughs> thanks, Arvin. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, 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 Susan. Bye, bye. Bye.